Hello, followers. It's weird talking to you in English today, but Francis doesn't know Portuguese yet, so that's Not how yet. we're going to roll. Uh, as promised, I'm here today with Francis Buckley. Um, I'm going to start reading a little bit about him, about, but he's here, so after that he's going to talk a little bit about himself, tell his story, a little bit of, of his up and coming, how he came to the audio business, production, and all that, but... Grammy Award-winning engineer and producer Francis Buckley has worked on many gold and platinum-selling recordings with artists ranging from Black Flag, Aerosmith to Quincy Jones, Celine Dion, and Alanis Morissette. He won the Grammy for Best Engineer Album for Q's Juke Joint by Quincy Jones and also contributed to Morissette's 1995 Album of the Year, Jag a Little Pill. And his, it says that you teach two courses at MIT, but you teach way more than this now. Yeah, way more. <laughs> and so... Francis, welcome. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And yeah, why, why don't you just start, uh, talk a little bit, a little bit about yourself. And um, yeah. well, I'm the um, I'm the greatest recording engineer to ever set up a <laughs> microphone. Thank you. It was nice being here. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Um, I um, I'm from Detroit, right? right. And um, uh, Detroit was a wonderful place to grow up, um, but it wasn't a wonderful place to stay. Right, mm -hmm. um, and I got involved in music when I was a kid playing drums, and my teacher was the um, he was my grandfather's cousin. Whatever that I don't know what <laughs> relation yeah. that makes him to me. Anyways, um, he was in his eighties when I started taking drum lessons, and he was in the original NBC orchestra when they were on radio. He was the drummer, and his wife was the piano player, and. Um, when I started taking lessons, one of the interesting things he said to me was, um, everybody's going to tell you the music business is a wonderful hobby, but not a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, you know, I've, I mean, I'm only, this is when I, I started between my last year of grade school and my first year of high school, I started taking drum lessons. And I told him, I said, yeah, I, I kind of started hearing that already. And he said, let me tell you something. And what he said to me went right straight into my heart. It's been there forever. I have done the same thing he's done. So now I can say this from my own point of view. And that is, I've been in the music business my entire life. I've never lived high in the hog, but I have enjoyed every minute of it. And that was when he said that to me, boy, it just, like I said, that didn't go in here, man. That went in here. Yeah. And it really inspired me. It's like, you know what? This is not a, this isn't a job. This isn't, and I didn't choose the music business. It kind of chose me. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I really got excited about it on a, I think it was in November. Was it in November? Anyways, 1964, when I was 10 years old, when the Beatles played live on Ed Sullivan. Yes. And I just went. <laughs> <laughs> That's the stuff. I could do that. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, moved out to L.A. and played drums and I played in a band. And my band and I moved out to L.A. in 1977. And, yeah. of course, we were kind of a somewhere between, like, the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan. We were that kind of mm. – a little more on the jazz side of the street. So right? when you saw the Beatles, you wanted to play. Oh, yeah. Then it's oh, absolutely. That was yeah. what I wanted to do. Um, I don't know what it was that attracted me to the drums – but I didn't. I wasn't interested in the guitar or the bass or singing or anything. Mm -hmm. It was something about playing the drums. Um, but my band moved out here to California, and we played all original music. Right? But we needed to eat. Yes. So we got a job <laughs> <laughs> playing on the pier in Redondo Beach. Cool. And we had to learn a bunch of cover songs, which we had never done before. Mm -hmm. Right. And every week. Uh, we used to play weekends, and at the end of the Sunday night gig, the bar owner would hand us a list of new songs that he wanted us to be able to play next week. Right? Okay. So our practices, which were all about playing our music, trying to get ourselves a deal, e devolved, and I say devolved, into us learning cover tunes and not really liking it. Mm -hmm. And now we're working five days a week doing our regular job, and then Saturday and Sunday night playing in this club, and it just got to be too much Intense. and what happened my band broke up yes right. the faith of many of yeah many that's kind of that's how i always ask the question i say to my students my band did what all bands do what is that uh, break up yeah <laughs> that's what we all do right yeah so um all but two of them there were six of us all but two of them 
abandoned California and went back. And I was at a crossroads. It's like, I don't really want to join another band, right? Um, so I kind of started, I had been into recording because I was into electronic music, right? Mm -hmm. Not EDM, not today's electronic music, but a whole new medium, right? Um, so I, I, you know, started hanging around recording studios because I thought, okay, maybe this... And the the I had one of those really good, really bad experiences. The really good experience was I'm in this hanging around in studios with the best players in town, right? Yes. Right? The bad experience was I'm in a recording studio hanging out with the best players in town, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's two-way and, street. Yeah, I started to see guys like John Robinson and Vinnie Caliuta and these cats and going, that's my competition? Mm -hmm. I'm a drummer. The, I... I I'm nowhere near where these guys are, so it's time for plan B. So, um, you know, I'm hanging around in the studio with these amazing players and going, I'm, I'm not going to get anywhere. But I always had an interest in recording because as an electronic musician, um, synth back in those days played one note at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to realize a piece, you needed to record it because you needed to record the first note and then the second note. So I had bought a little four-track tape recorder and I was playing around with that and I just I kind of enjoyed it and I decided that okay I better go to school I better find some school because it's a real difficult thing to learn to be an engineer by just hanging around in the recording studio so I went to a place called um, uh, uh, Dick Grove Music Workshop in Hollywood and they had a 10-week audio engineering course right mm -hmm. and as you know yourself yeah. 10 weeks Fly by. Gone, right? Yes. But at the end of the 10 weeks, the guy who ran the, the, the program approached me and said, so what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I wasn't really sure. And he said, well, you really have a good aptitude for this. You you catch on and you caught it all pretty quickly. Um, I said, well, I'd like to go get a job. He goes, no, you need to finish your education. Mm. I said, okay, where do I go? Well, he said, you got to go to Brian Inglesby Sound Masters. Right. So I looked up Sound Masters, and it was it was like MI. It was like this place, right? Only it was a year long. Right? Okay. And so I went through that program, and the as I look back, I realize that the minimalist approach that my mentor Brian Inglesby had was perfect mm -hmm. because he taught us signal flow. Right? You got to know how it gets in. You got to know how it moves around. You got to know how it gets out. Right. If you get that down, then it's signal processing. You got to learn how to use all of this other stuff. Yeah. Right. But it was those two simple concepts. Right. And that, when I went out into the into the the, the you know the real world, um, I got a job in a little voiceover studio in mm. Redondo Beach. And voiceover is like this: one, two microphones, some music, and somebody reading. You know, hey, go buy the new Ford product. You know, mm -hmm. that was kind of what I was doing wasn't getting a lot of recording experience in it because one microphone not, can only get so yeah, far not a lot to do but when i started it was a little place called we studios in redondo beach and the guy who ran it i was wasn't working for him for very long a couple of months when he decided he was going to gut the studio and rebuild it mm. right so from that i learned studio design i learned about floating floors and walls within walls and separation and and all this other stuff so that was without realizing it that was a really great education mm -hmm. even though you know i want to be a recording engineer but what am i doing yeah <laughs> you know school of life right? yeah yeah um and i worked there for not too long a time when the woman who ran this the um placement department at, that's a school mm -hmm. called me up and said um, we have a, a job for you at a recording studio. And I said, great, right? And so I went to the studio, a place called Unicorn Records. Hmm. And I did the interview, and at the end of the interview, the woman hands me a set of keys. And she said, your job is to open up in the morning, and close up at night. That was my That's entire it? job. That was it. I wasn't a runner. I wasn't an assistant. I was the guy with the keys, right? Really? Well, you know, if I'm opening up in the morning and I'm locking up at night, that means I'm there before everybody and I'm there until everybody leaves. Yes. Right? Um, so I ass assisted on a few sessions under two engineers, a guy named John Guess, who's a big-time Nashville guy, and Ed Stasium. 
And Ed, um, Ed's big claim to fame, besides a lot of other things, was the Ramones. He did all the Ramones records. And, cool. Um, and I was there for a very short amount of time. I think it was less than a month, like a three weeks is what I think it was, mm -hmm. when I came in one morning and the woman who ran the studio called me into her office and said, hey, chief engineer just quit. You are now chief engineer, and the band Black Flag will be here at 1 o'clock to start their new record. Yes. So... I'm less, literally less than a year out of school, and I'm chief engineer at a recording studio with all the response. I went from the guy with the keys mm -hmm. <laughs> to chief engineer like that. And and that's the way a lot of engineers on, on like, decades before today they come up like that. You got to wait until someone gets sick, until someone mm -hmm. doesn't show up. Yeah. And then it's your turn. And then it's your turn. And then you, you either do it or you don't. Yes. Right? So... It was, I got to say, it was a very terrifying experience because when she gave me that, you know, you're now the chief engineer, and I walked out of her office, and if I turned left, that's the front door, and if I turned right, that's the door to the studio, and I stood there for a second going, do I just run away? Because this is like, I'm freaked out. Do I just run away? Mm -hmm. And I went, no, 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 go go do this, All right? Um, and when the band came in, the producer was a guy named Spot, And I pulled him aside and I said, I got to tell you, man, I've never run this console before. Um, they just promoted me to chief engineer. I've never, he was like, put his arm on my shoulder and said, don't worry, man, we'll make this happen. And it was, That's good. it was a great experience. And I was not, this is what to me, one of the interesting things was I was not into punk music. Right. Yeah. I was into progressive rock, <laughs> time changes and real, you know, stuff that you just watch these guys play and you go, oh, I yeah. wish I could play like that. Um, and I was like, oh, this is really going to be a pain. Right? Mm -hmm. But one of the big things I learned was these cats, the guys in, in Black Flag, um, Henry Rollins, um, Greg Ginn, Des Kadena, all those cats were total pros, mm -hmm. total pros. So even though the music was punk, these guys were serious about it. They took it seriously. You know, if it would have been a... I forget what it was, two months or whatever it was, if it had been a big party and just everybody going wild and whatever they get. But no, it was total experience and yeah. I learned a hell of a lot. People think that because it's punk and it's dirty, it doesn't mean the musicians as professionals are going to be like that. Yeah. So I was, you kind of anticipated a question I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. On that black flag, it's damaged, right? Yeah. The first record, the first record you ever engineered mm -hmm. and it's a genre of music that you, you, you weren't really fond of, yeah. right? How was your mindset on, on being like, okay, this is not what I like, mm -hmm. but this is what I need to get done? Um, now, this is not something that came to me then. It's something that came to me years later. Uh, but I think the thought was somewhere in the back of my head that regardless of anything, for me, the two most important words on any record are Francis Buckley. Okay, So regardless of its black flag and its punk, It was done by me. Mm -hmm. So every project that you're working on is the advertisement for your next project. So because they were pros and because Spot was cool and I was in this unique position, I th just threw myself into it and said, you know what? It's not about whether I like the music or not. It's about I've been hired to do this gig and I got to do it to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And when I look back, uh, you know, I have... 70 or more commercially released albums in my discography and then lots of other ones but the array of artists that i have done if i would have done just progressive rock i would have done three albums yeah <laughs> that would have been it you know but because i had an open mind and i was willing to do whatever i've had number one records in in every genre except rap but <laughs> and it's Uh, you know, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. It's not that I don't like rap. It's just it, those opportunities never came up. Yeah, It's just one of those things. Yeah, you know? it, it came up. It came up as punk for punk rock for you. Yeah. If it was rap, you're gonna yeah. do it. Yeah. Right? I mean, I you know I did some rappers with Quincy, and I did mm -hmm. some stuff with LL Cool J, um, but it just wasn't. I don't know. To me, maybe it's because I'm you know be, haven't been raised with the Beatles. Melody is so important to me, mm -hmm. and when I don't hear a melody doesn't resonate with you no. and that's fine yeah right. yeah so what do you like if, if we go away to the front of the like skip some years i'm i'm thinking you started with punk rock mm -hmm. with the black flag record 
is that something is there something on that uh experience not really sound wise but more of a mental thing that helped you on other stuff like with quincy things you learn like oh this is how it works because this is your first experience so you mm -hmm. learn a lot on those first yeah. passes right yeah so are there things that you think about that you really learn on that first and you carry it on for the rest of your life i i think so and I, I, again i'm not going to say this was something that that day i went oh this is this is this is it you know what i mean it was a slow uh -huh. process but one of the things that that i learned and 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 it got to very quickly and i think it helped me in my career is that you know and quincy said it so elegantly to me one time don't nobody know nothing okay <laughs> nobody knows anything we're we're all making a guess right i guess i'll set my alarm clock and i guess i'll wake up when my alarm clock goes off and I guess I'll get up and I'll go to work. And I guess I'll make it to work. You know what I mean? It's yeah. all a guess. But some of us have a little more education behind the guess. So one of the things to me was that um, I I never was a, I know how to do this. I was a, um, I'm not real sure how to do this. <laughs> but I'll, you know, I'll work through it. Do my best. Yeah. So I never went into anything like, oh, I know all of this. Because that's that's a that's a block. Mm -hmm. That's a wall. I know this, right? Well, some you leave no room for improvement. Yeah, yeah. So I've, you know, that don't nobody know nothing without knowing it has been one of my lifetime mantras. Yeah, you know, um, you know, in in the way I teach, one of the things I tell students is, you're always going to be recording an instrument for the first time, right? Like, you know, we do drums and bass and guitar and all that stuff. But as, if you get active. People are going to walk in with instruments you've never recorded before, mm -hmm. right? So you could go up to them and go, what is that? I never recorded one of those before. And they'll go, it's a harp. And again, kind of have this idea that, you know. You but don't. if you go with the right attitude, right, like um, mentioning the harp, uh, you know, one of these kind of things. I had never recorded one before. And I was on a session and this girl showed up with a harp. And, you know, it's in a big case and somebody helps her come in and open it and take it out. And... It's gorgeous. I mean, you know, when somebody walks in with a custom acoustic guitar, how yeah. inlay and all that stuff, how beautiful. And this was the same thing. And so I went over to her and, you know, I've been doing this for a while, so I kind of knew how to approach it. But I said to her, wow, what a gorgeous instrument. And she was like, oh, thank you. Right. And I said, I, you know, I've, I've heard these a million times, but I've never really seen one up close. And I said, can how does this thing work? And she was showing me like the separations and, and whatnot, like a piano. And I said, so you've, you've recorded before, obviously. Oh yeah. So how do other guys mic this? And she explained to me the whole thing about mm -hmm. the strings are connected to the box on the bottom. It's like an acoustic guitar. Yeah. That box on the bottom is the resonator. And she showed me where to put the microphone. Right. And we had a great conversation. Well, if I had to come up and said, what, what is this? Well, it's a harp. How do I mic it? Right. Yeah. But we had a great conversation. You're not really connecting. Because the first thing I did, I said, wow, what a gorgeous instrument. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, that goes to one of the things I was talking about, the compliment sandwich. Right. What a gorgeous instrument. How do I mic it? What a gorgeous instrument. Wow, that's really beautiful. So I complimented her and got the information I need and another yeah. compliment and off you go. Yeah, it has to do with keeping the flow of session and, and never forgetting we were... We're here to have fun. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're recording music. Yeah, we're not we're not opening someone else's someone's yeah. chest. Like, there's no risk. Yeah, like nobody's uh, gonna die. Yeah, well. you said it to me, and I've heard it from other engineers. Like, this this is a tense industry. There's a lot of money involved and ego, but at the end of the day, aside from like extreme situations, no one will die. No. So if you want to EQ something differently, compress. Just do it. Yeah. The 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 only thing we, you may hear it's not nah, it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Go back. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like you know you 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 do things the way you hear them, right? And someone everybody's always going to hear it another way, right? And that's one thing that um, when I first started mixing, right, um, it was like I would do a mix and somebody wouldn't like it, and dude, I was I would be devastated. Yes. It's like ah oh, man. I'm no good at this. I got to find something. And then one day it dawned on me. That's an opinion. 
That's mm. all it is. It's an opinion. If you don't like the sound of the guitar, that doesn't mean it's wrong. That means in your opinion, it's not right. Yeah. Right? So that's what we deal with. But it's also a creative industry. And you got to, it's the positivity that keeps the creativeness flowing. Negativity is like creativity and negativity are completely di diametrically opposed, right? Mm -hmm. Creativity is happy and working away, and negativity comes in the room, and creativity goes, okay, bye, <laughs> and leaves. Yeah, it's the yeah. enemy, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know? uh, that may tie it up to a question that it's, it's from a, a note student of yours. He contacted me. I asked for questions, and he, he, asked, he asked me to ask you, how do you stay so positive all the time? Because I guess that's the impression he had. When he was your student. Well, I think that actually goes back to what we were just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I I have a a very very um, fiery Irish temper. I mean, Irish. Okay. I, I'm like I'm a break stuff when I get really <laughs> mad. I and and one time I broke something I wish I hadn't broken, right? And that taught me a lesson. But I'm not going to say I oh so I'm now a happy person. No, no. It's a I, process. I yeah. think part of it is is that. One of the things that I was was, in, you know, in, embedded in me in the in learning process is, you don't bring negativity into the studio. You just don't, right? Mm -hmm. I have a thousand ways to say no without using the word the letter N or O. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I don't just go no. You know, um, everything is. I just try to be positive because that's what makes. The session go you like the compliment sandwich you sound great you're a little flat but you sound great yeah right okay if i just said you sound flat can you sing that it's like yeah rah, 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 you know so i think it's just been a process that i've just concentrated on being positive that it's just just into a positive are. person yeah you know yeah i think the answer might be how do you stay positive is you gotta keep keep that in your mind yeah. You're not going to be positive all every day of, of, of your life. No. That's impossible. But no. if no. you keep that in mind, yeah. right? And again, this is, nobody's going to die, you know? So it's like, you know, I have I have two children in the in the medical profession. They're both nurses. Mm. And they just got getting started. And my son was devastated the other day because the patient died. And mm. it was like, you know, I mean, that's, and you carry that with you. You know, yeah. so I mean that's part of the reason I'm not in the medical profession. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My father's a doctor, and I I couldn't take it like really, and it really puts in perspective. As you said, when you were beginning, someone didn't like the mix, you feel terrible. I I went through that. I still do, and as I said, the perspective like, hey, someone died right in front of them yeah. while they're working. Like, who cares about my snare sound? Yeah, I mean, even <laughs> though. They were not responsible yeah. for the death. It was like COVID. You know, my son works in the, in a COVID ward, and these people are. But the first time it happened to him, it was. But you know, we had to kind of talk him down a little bit. It's like, no, you didn't. It's didn't not do. something you you did or didn't do. It's just yes. the way it is. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I've I was always attracted to the entertainment industry for that particular reason because everybody seems to be having fun. You know, mm -hmm. now, yeah, you get behind the scenes and it gets tense, right? That's why I have a huge stockpile of jokes. Huge <laughs> yes, you do. Stockpile of jokes. <laughs> I've heard a lot of them. Yeah. And I, I know there are still a lot to come. Yeah. Some I, I can't tell on the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, since we're talking about big stuff, big ego, I guess, and uh, let's jump to the Queen Seat part. Right. That involves a Grammy, and people only care about Grammys. That, as was you the, know. that was the Grammy winner. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you connect with Quincy, and how was the process? Because if you watching this, never heard that record. Q's Juke Joint sounds amazing. You engineered it. You didn't mix it, right? Um, well, I did two mixes, but what there was just circumstances that what happened was the album got done and released, and there were some contractual obligations, and they pulled the song and replaced the singers. So mm -hmm. I went in and remixed that one, and I mixed um, another one called, um, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, uh, uh, put a move on my heart with mm, uh, Tanya, Tamia, right? Yeah. And um, but the album was already out and printed and everything, so they inserted these new tr two new tracks into it. Mm. I didn't get credit for it, but it's okay. I I, I engineered okay. the album from start to finish, mm -hmm. you know, um, but. It was the interesting thing to me was 
the album was mixed by Bruce Sudin, okay? And I had worked on the album. And it's, it's a funny story because I, I was contacted by the production coordinator. And Quincy, I knew Quincy because I worked with Glenn Ballard, and Glenn was signed to Quincy's production company. So that's how I met him, mm -hmm. right? And he was getting ready to do this record, but his guy, Bruce, was, was working with Michael Jackson doing history, so Bruce was not available. Mm -hmm. So Quincy said to the production coordinator, Jolie, um, give me an engineer. So Jolie called me and said, you know, would you be interested? And I said, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get the words Couldn't's out of my mouth fast enough. Um, but it was supposed to have been a live album, right? Yeah. And I started the day after Thanksgiving. We were supposed to be done by Christmas. I mean, finished. I was going to do four days, cut the tracks. Al Schmidt was going to do the big band horns and Mick Kozowski was going to come in, set up the mixes and the artists were going to come in and sing to the final mix as it went down. Wow. That was supposed to be the way it was. So I get to Capitol and it's fun. It's a party. And we messed around for four days and got, I think we got maybe one or two tracks out of that four day session in Capitol. Really? And we had, you know, all the great players and it was, it was a lot of fun. But at the end of the four days, I said to the contractor or the, the production coordinator, I said, now what? Nothing's finished. And she said, well, you know, um, can you hang around? I said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll clear my calendar for next week. If Quincy needs me, I'm there. Okay. Yeah. I wound up working on that album for seven and a half months. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. What are we doing next week? I don't know. Okay. Well, I'll be available. All right. And everybody came in on that record. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Fortunately for me, it was in the latter part of my career so i was i wasn't like starstruck when ray charles walks in the room mm -hmm. or any of these other may herbie hancock or any of these other amazing people that came in the room mm -hmm. right and um but then when bruce came in when uh, we were getting ready to do the mix and i was to the point because this was pre pro tools right we use pro tools at the very end of the project at the beginning of the album there's a voice collage all these, it's kind of, it's supposed to be people trying to get into the juke joint and they're with the bouncer and the bouncer's talking to everybody. No, yeah. you can't come in. Uh -huh. Oh, I got to come in here. And it's this whole, <laughs> so we put that together with a very uh, early version of Pro Tools, right? So that meant every day when I came into work, I had to do a rough mix. So I, by the time we finished and got ready to mix, I had mixed these songs over and times. over again over and i was i was like i really want to do the mix but man i don't know what i'm going to bring to the mix and yeah. I, I you lost perspective idea. yeah and then i came in one morning and the, the, um, quincy's girl had come in and set down a bunch of papers for quincy for that day and i just happened to look over and there was a note from bruce saying hey done with michael if you need anything i'm around right and i went quincy uh, you're gonna have bruce mix this he said I was thinking about it. it kind of gave me that look like i went oh i said thank you because yeah. i don't know what i would do yeah so and it's always good to give it to bruce yeah well it's like, well but the other thing is i'm about to turn this over to arguably one of the finest recording engineers in the world who's going to scrutinize every track that i <laughs> recorded right They're like sucks yeah that's hard you know uh, and he said in an interview that it was the easiest album he ever mixed because everything was right where it should be. Oh, that's And so I was cool. like, oh my God. So when we, when I did the other mixes, Bruce has done, the album's done and whatnot, and I take the mixes to Bernie Grunman to have them put in with the master and recut the record, right? Bernie takes the, the, the master tape and he takes out Bruce's mix and he puts in my mix, right? Now he's got to go through the mastering process again. So he's he's sets up the song in front of the one I did and he sets up the song after the one I did and he puts the one I did in there and he's going back and forth and he turns to me and he goes, I don't need to do anything to this. Mm -hmm. You go to mastering and the guy doesn't have to do anything when he's comparing it to Bruce Houdin's mixes. So that gave me a one hell of an ego boost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, um, it was a, it was a great experience all the way around because the beauty of working with somebody like Quincy is his thing is, you're a pro. I hired you to do your gig. Do your gig. He never questioned anything I did. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Because it's like, hey. He trusts you. Francis, you ready to go? Yeah, great. 
let's go. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, it was, it was a, it was a big. Any thing. any crazy, crazy slash funny story about that? Because that many celebrities coming, like I'm not gonna say celebrities, but great yeah. musicians like yeah. legends. Yeah, uh, something that comes to your mind. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stories. Some of them I, I, I really can't tell. But yeah. Somebody told me one time I should write a book. I said. It would be a pamphlet because most of those stories I'm not going to tell out of school. <laughs> right? um, but uh, the first time we worked with Ray Charles, right, we did the song Let the Good Times Roll, yes. which is a song with three verses. So Quincy says he's definitely going to get Ray to sing the last verse, right? And I was so, when I heard him say he's bringing in Ray Charles, I've been a fan of Ray Charles forever. And it's like, oh, my God, working with Quincy is one thing, but I get to work with Ray Charles. It's going to be great, right? So I come in and... and because I'm so excited, I, I didn't hear what else Quincy said, right? I'm just like, blah, 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 going on over here, and I'm going, Ray Charles, Ray Charles, <laughs> right, right? So the next day I come in, and I walk in, and the receptionist says, uh, Mr. Charles is in the studio. Ray's here already? Yeah. So I go in, and Ray's sitting there, and I introduce myself, and we're talking for a little bit. And Quincy comes in, and Ray's attitude changes. He's like, pissed off, pissed off about really? something, right? But it was something that Quincy knew about because you could tell the two of them were in conversation right now. Uh-huh. So we get ready to go and we go out and Ray's going to sit at the piano. He's not singing. He just wants to sit at the piano. So I set the mic up and I get everything and I put pop filter in front of it. And like the man could see, he reached up and he grabbed that pop filter and he said, pop filter? And I said, yeah. And he tore it off the stand and threw it down on the ground. And he said, that's for people that don't know how to sing. And I said, thank you, Ray. <laughs> right. And of course, you know, Ray sings like this while yeah. I'm in front of the microphone. Anyways, so I go back in the control room and I bring up the, 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 the fader. I've got the preamp ready to go. I got the compressor ready to go. Ray doesn't say a word. I, I know the mic's working because I can hear him breathing. And he's, as he moves, you can hear the piano bench creaking. So I know at least the mic is working. Mm-hmm. Right? Quincy's not saying anything. Ray's not saying anything. I'm like going, do I go? What, you know, what do I do? And all of a sudden, Ray yells out, engineer, you got a level. Let's do this goddamn thing. Right? So I reach over. And, of course, you know me, playing record. I put it in record. And Ray sings his part song comes to an end ray goes like this he motions because he has a guy that leads him around he motions Uh and the guy comes over and he grabs the guy by the arm and he leaves right out the side door gone doesn't say a word to anybody just gets up and leaves right and ray and, and and quincy turns to me and he goes you got that didn't you and I said, oh, yeah, I did. He said, okay, good. Because that was it. That was the only. So you go listen to Ray Charles sing Let the Good Times Roll. That is the one and only take that I wasn't ready for. And you will hear when he goes, hey, I'll tell you. Yeah. You'll hear the distortion. <laughs> but that was it. So, you know, I mean, if there was ever an example to solidify what I say about always being in record, that was it. Because he said to me, do you have a level, right? He didn't say, let's record this. He said, you got a level. Well, how can I have a level? You haven't said anything, Mm -hmm. nothing, right? Most engineers, I think, probably would have hit play and adjusted the levels and said, okay, let's do this. You would have lost it. Not me, yeah. And that's, I mean, I record everything. You know me, always being Mm -hmm. recorded. I've captured so much great stuff on take one, right? Yeah. Um, when you you ask about the positivity, um, the you can totally freak an artist out in a studio to the point where you're not going to get anything out of them, right? And one of the words is record, right? right? Because they're out there. Yeah, we're just running. Okay, we're going to record. Oh no, we're going to record. This is it. The real thing. I'm getting stiffed. You know. So I. So I go, you are ever saying we're just running, but yeah, you're actually recording. Yeah. Let's. We're just going to run it down. You know. And then when I could do another take, I go. That was pretty good. Can we do another one? Didn't use the word record, right? And the beauty yeah. of Pro Tools is, unless you're sitting here, you can't see the red lights. Yeah. So you're getting the good takes. It's not even take one. It's take zero. <laughs> well, yeah. it's always take one. Yeah, you but yeah. you mean like yeah. for them, it's for like them, just it's running. Like they don't even know what it is, yeah. right? Um, so to me, that's that's one of those things. It's like we keep it positive. We keep it moving, right? You try not to get bogged down in little things, you know, I mean, uh, I have a big thing about 
different and better. Okay? Mm. If you're going to play a different guitar solo, then I'll keep the first one. If you're going to play a better guitar solo, I'm always down for that. But when it's just, you know, uh, it, that sounds great. Can I do another one? You got a better one in you? Well, I don't know. And you sing it again and you go, it's not better, it's just different. So yep. I, I look at that as like, you know, the old thing about never change your answer on a math test. Mm -hmm. Because your first answer was probably right. Trust your guts. It's kind of the same thing. Don't don't mess this up. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. But of course nowadays you got Pro Tools. So you can record everything. And I I think that's a big problem because you can record everything. You know, it used to be I got one track left for vocals. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, too much freedom, it's no freedom at all. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. In that situation. Yeah. There's a an amazing line in a song by Billy Joel. And the line is, all your choices make you change your mind. Mm -hmm. and that's all you're doing. It's just changing your mind. Yes. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we're towards the end of it. Okay. We've been here for a while. I I'll be here for hours and hours. <laughs> but eventually we got to go. Yeah. I got just a few more questions yeah. that they came from the followers. Yeah. I think this they're more direct. And you can answer them on a quicker mm -hmm. fashion if you want. Um, so... I didn't get the names. I'm sorry. I'll do this next time. But someone <laughs> asked me, asks you. You can, you, you can put it underneath. Yeah. I'm trying to get. Yeah. Do you worry about monocompatibility? If so, what methods do you use to ensure that? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I mean, because mono still exists. Movies, television, radio, concerts, they're all mono, right? Um, so I am always using that mono button. Yeah. Boom, pop it down to mono and, and see what happens. Right. Um, doing that on a DAW is a little bit more tricky, right? Um, sometimes what I'll do if I'm not sure about mono compatibility, I'll take the pan pots and put them up in the center because now when they're both in the center, if you got mono, if you got mono compatibility problems, you'll hear them, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, it's it's incredibly important because most of the time nowadays, if you're going to make money, real money off of a piece of music, it's because it winds up on film and television. Mm -hmm. And if it winds up in film and television, you cannot have any phase errors at all because yeah. they will pull that cue and that'll be the end of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it, it, the mono button is your, is your best friend. Yeah. So for you that don't know, he, he, he told me that story already in film and television, they actually check visually. Like they don't even care if it sounds right. Yeah. If it's visually out of phase on the on the scope, they're gonna recall it and you're yeah. gonna be in trouble. And you know. they just got somebody looking at a meter. That's yeah. all it is. Yep. Um, what do you feel when listening back to old mixing projects you've done? Of mine? Yeah. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a problem everybody has, right? Like, yeah. I, and and the one thing that I say, you know, especially because students are always coming to me about this. You know, I I of all the records that I've done, and I've done a lot of them, there's very, very few that I can listen to because I know. You know, my wife will go, what, I don't hear that? Well, I hear it, right? So I, you know, I know where all the problems are. I, you know, um, so, but that is your gasoline. That is your fuel. The idea that that didn't mix didn't come out great. The next one's going to be better, mm -hmm. right? And when you get to the point and there are some big name engineers that do this stuff. They have a way to work. This is how they work. And everything you bring to them goes through their mixing process. And they do it the way they do it. And it's it's the same compressors and the same equalizing the same thing every time. And what happens is, yeah, all your mixes sound exactly the same. Mm -hmm. To me, I grew up in music publishing where the song was king. right? So to me, every song is its own country. Every song gets its own treatment. I don't... I don't use templates. Mm -hmm. I use presets that I always mess around with, right? But I think of everything as its own individual thing, you know? Yes. I have four children. They all need discipline, but they all get disciplined in a different way because they're different yeah. people. They didn't come out the same. No, it doesn't come out the same. Yeah. No. And I, I love that you mentioned, like, that's the fuel when you listen to an old mix and you hear all the problems because the moment you hear it and you think, I'm fucking great. Yeah. That's the moment you kind of stop That's it. going forward, right? That's it. Yeah, because yeah. once you go, and this is what I hear in some, and there's just a couple of these big time guys out there that it's like every mix they do sounds exactly the same. And mm -hmm. it's like, 
you know, well, yeah, everyone sounds great. No, they don't sound great, but they sound exactly the same, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so to close this off, uh, if you could give our viewers here, uh, they are mostly engineers, producers, musicians. Right. The ones who got to this point definitely are. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe some piece of advice for the up and coming guys. Yeah. What do you think about the future and advice? Well, the interesting thing that I've found is that, because, you know, I lived through the great convergence from analog to digital yeah. and through the greater convergence of from the recording studio to the home studio i was i was the guy in the front line of all of that stuff You're i there. was i slogged through all of that the process never changes the equipment changes we're still doing the same thing we still have our signal flow still works the same our processors still work the same so to me it's to learn those fundamentals don't learn how to work a compressor learn how compressors work right because you'll you know I, I've, I've had students say oh here's somebody show me here's a setting on the compressor for a vocal no that's a compressor setting on a compressor for that vocal not for your vocal right mm -hmm. so if you if you only understand how to work a comp or how to work a compressor you never really understand how they work and mm -hmm. that to me is the big thing because I, I was only taught how things work. I never, Brian, my, he never showed us how to use any of this stuff, mm -hmm. right, that I, re, that I recall. So everything was like, okay, um, like learning to mix, I would listen to records, right? And why do their drums sound like he's hitting harder or something? And I go, well, that's dynamics, that's volume. So it must be a dynamics processor. What could it be? Well, it's not a gate. You only got two choices. You either got a gate or a compressor, right? It must be compressor. Let me try a compressor across my mix, right? So for me, the big thing is never give up experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm to the point now where you, you'll see me, I go out and I do something, boom, and I come back in because I've already done all my exper experimentation, yeah. right? And so that's the thing. Don't, get, don't give up. Don't get frustrated. Right. Mm -hmm. Understand that you will do a better mix tomorrow than you did today. Yes. You will always keep moving forward until you become satisfied. Never become satisfied. <laughs> always have a rock in your shoe mm -hmm. that's making you, pushing you forward. I got to do better. I got to do better. And that's, that's what, that's how get you get better. Yeah. yeah. That's how you get better is by doing it. You know, I would assume that a lot of your listeners are musicians. Yeah. Right. So the thing to that is, how did you get good at being a musician? Not by playing your guitar every now and then. No. <laughs> every day. You got to do this every day. You, you mix a song, put it away, take it out a month later, do another mix on it. Use different plugins, use different things, put it away, take it out again, do another mix and keep comparing these mixes. And you'll go, well, I like this mix better, but the bass sound I had in that mix. And you go, well, what did I do mm -hmm. different? Because we got... Pro Tools, you can save it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's the cool thing. That's something to, we, we take for granted every day. Yeah. We can go back and we can save it. Yeah. And 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 don't get into the mindset that of, of the word always, right? People say, oh, you always compress a kick drum. No, you don't. You compress a kick drum for two reasons. One, it needs it. And two, you want to do it. Mm -hmm. There's no always. <laughs> yes. None at all. There's no always. Yeah. Yep. That's a good one to leave. Yep. Francis, thank you very much. Thank Always you. a pleasure. My pleasure. Hope you guys like it. Is there a way to, uh, if someone wants to find you, uh, do you have Instagram? I don't think so, um, right? Well, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. I'm not a big social media guy except Facebook. I like to argue with people on Facebook. <laughs> um, but I have my website, francisbuckley.com. Okay. Um, but Facebook is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Yeah. Please, yeah. everybody, listen to that Quincy record, uh, Black Flag record. It's good. I love it. Yeah. Great. And yeah, thank you so much. All right. See you soon. See you.